Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me here for this discussion on individual incentive pay plans. Now, an incentive pay plan, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is something is a pay structure that is designed to compensate our employees based upon performance in an effort to motivate them and fairly reward them. So a well-designed incentive pay plan will be strongly tied to important performance metrics so that in their efforts to achieve these incentives, our employees will improve the performance that we care about the most. Okay, the first of these that we're going to discuss here today is called a piecework rate plan or a piece rate plan. Okay, and essentially what happens here is employees are paid based upon what they produce. This works really well in environments like factories and warehouses where there are basic standard routine things that employees need to do. So to give you an example of a piece rate plan, let's imagine that we have an employee working in a warehouse and they've got a pallet jack here and their job is to pick packages that get palletized, wrapped up and shipped out to, to customers. Okay. So if we were putting together a piece rate plan, we might pay our employee 10 cents per package picked. Okay. And maybe over the course of an eight hour shift, the employee is able to pick 1,920 packages. And because we're paying them 10 cents per package ship, they are able to earn $192. And that works out to about $24 per hour. Okay, the example that we just provided here is what we would call a straight piecework plan. And the reason we call it a straight piecework plan is because no matter how much the employee produces, they get paid the same amount per unit that they've, that they've produced, or in this case, per package picked. But sometimes we want to set a target and pay our employees a little more if they exceed it. And the idea here is that we, we have a target that we think is what one person can do, but we say, you know, if all of our employees exceed that target by a little bit, we can avoid hiring a new person. And it's a little bit less expensive to pay our employees a little bit more to be more productive than it is to bring a new person on board. So in this example, what we would do is we'd, we'd start with setting our goal. And our goal here, we'll say, is 200 packages per hour or 200 items per hour. And that works out to be 1,600 items for the entire eight-hour shift. And what we do here is we say... We're going to pay 10 cents per, per package picked up to the goal. So the first 1,600 items in an eight-hour shift are going to get paid at 10 cents per item. But everything that exceeds that 1,600 items is going to be paid at 15 cents per package. Okay. Now our employee goes and picks the same 1,920 packages that they picked in the previous example. Only this time we calculate their pay a little bit differently. It's 1,600 times 10 cents plus 320 times 15 cents, 320 obviously being the number of packages that they exceeded their goal by. And that gives them $208 for the entire shift. So in this case, we've given our employees a little bit of an incentive to exceed their goal. And because we've given them that incentive, they've helped us not have to hire an additional person. All right. And we, when we put these types of piece rate plans together, they're called differential piece rate plans because we have one level that we pay up to a certain point and then when employees exceed that point, we pay another level. Okay, building on the piece rate plans, we have something called a standard hour plan. And with a standard hour plan, what we do is we kind of calculate how long it takes to do a specific task. And then, and then each time an employee completes that task, we pay them for the amount of time that we've estimated the task should take. So if a task is estimated to take 30 minutes, but it only takes an employee 20 minutes, each time they complete that task, they get paid for 30 minutes. All right, so let's give an example here, and we'll say we have a basic uh, computer service call that we estimate should take about 30 minutes, okay? And an employee completes 18 basic computer service calls in seven hours. At the end of that seven-hour shift, the employee actually gets paid for 18 calls times a half an hour per call. They actually get paid for nine hours, even though they only worked seven hours. And that's because we estimated that these basic service calls should take 30 minutes, so 18 of them should take nine hours, but we're paying the employee per call. And they only they only took seven hours to do all 18. So they earn seven hours. They they earn nine hours worth of pay in seven hours time because of their productivity here. So some of the drawbacks to piece rate plans and standard hours plans might be that employees may perform work at lower quality in order to increase their quantity. So for example, if we go back to our warehouse example example maybe the employee who's being paid on a piece rate plan 
doesn't look at the quality of the packages that they're picking to ship out. They don't differentiate between what, what is appropriate to send to a customer and what's not. They're just looking to quickly get all of the all of the number of packages that they need. You know, maybe they're a little, because they're rushing, they're more likely to have a few mispicks here and there. In the case of the computer service call example, perhaps the basic call is not as thorough as it would be if we were paying the employee by hour, so our customers get a little bit lower quality. The other thing that can happen is the incentives may cause competition among employees for resources. So if we go back to the warehouse example, you know, maybe we have some good pallet jacks and some bad pallet jacks in the warehouse and the employees realize that they need to have a good pallet jack in order to be productive. So they start competing for those pallet jacks. They're hiding them when they have to use the restroom or take a lunch break. So we don't have our best machines on the floor at all times because of the competition created by this. Okay, another type of, of incentive plan that we have is called a commission plan. Now, a commission plan is a form of compensation where the percentage of sales or the profit or a percentage of the profit from the sales is how we determine the employee's compensation. Now, this is different from a piece rate plan. A piece rate plan focuses on the number of units produced, whereas commission plans focus on dollars generated. Okay, and dollars are not units, so commission plans are different from from piece rate plans. So let's walk through an example of what a commission plan would look like. And let's say we have a salesperson and this salesperson is producing $2 million a year in sales. Uh, they're on a commission rate of 7%. What we would do to figure out their compensation is we would take the $2 million, multiply it by 7%, and the employee's compensation would be $140,000. All right, this here is an example of what we would call a straight commission plan because the employee is only paid commission, there's no base salary or any other compensation associated with, with how the employee is paid. Now, we can compare different types of commission plans, however. Uh, we have the straight commission plan that we just talked about, and we can have what's called a salary plus commission plan, where the employee gets a base salary and then earns, earns commission for their sales. So in a straight commission plan, the salary is obviously going to be $0.00. In a salary plus commission plan, let's say for this example that the, the base salary is going to be $50,000, okay? Now we're going to look at the commission rates as we, as we spelled out before. The commission rate in the straight commission plan that we're using for our example is 7%. Uh, because the salary plus commission plan um, has a base salary, the commission tends to be lower in these plans. So we're going to say the commission in the, this plan for our example is 4%. Okay, now we're going to look at what happens if the employee sells $2 million worth of, worth of product in each of these cases. Okay, in the straight commission plan, as we laid out before, the employee would, would earn $140,000. In the salary plus commission plan, though, it actually works out to be a little bit less because we take the 4%, we multiply it by the $2 million, and that gives us $80,000. Then we add that to the $50,000 salary. And in this case, the employee only earns $130,000. So does that mean that, that straight commission plans are always better than salary plus commission plans? Uh, that's not necessarily the case for our employees. If we were to pull that same example, only lower the employee's sales to $1.5 million, what we would see is that the, the commission on the straight commission plan would work out to be $105,000. However, on the salary plus commission plan, the employee would earn 4% of the $1.5 million, which is $60,000. We would add that to the $50,000 base salary, and the employee would earn $110,000. So in this case, the employee actually would earn a little more on a salary plus commission plan. Okay, what some companies do from time to time is they might offer their employees a choice between a straight commission plan and a salary plus commission plan. And what this does is this creates a, a scenario where the employee can have the security of salary while they're building a sales base and becoming good at their job. But as they become more successful, they can transition to a commission plan where they have the opportunity to earn more, but they're also a little more motivated to be productive because they're getting a larger percentage of their sales. Now, another type of individual incentive plan that we're going to talk about here is called merit pay. And merit pay is a situation where employees' annual increases are based upon their performance ratings. Okay, so we're going to take a look at what merit pay looks like in, in reality. And in this example, we're going, to, 
we're gonna have a little chart here and we've got employee ratings over on the left. So we've got our top performers, our satisfactory performers and our employees who need improvement. Okay, and then we're gonna, we're gonna look at how much our employees get paid and we've got them divided up into three, three different columns here based upon their COMPA ratio. And if you're not familiar with the COMPA ratio, I've got a video on that posted on YouTube that you can check out. But essentially over on the left here, we've got a COMPA ratio of less than 0 0.90, which means the employee is kind of underpaid. Here we've got a COMPA ratio that's between 0.9 and, and 1.1, which means the employee's paid pretty close to the average or the target. And then over here, we've got a COMPA ratio that's greater than, than 1.1, which means these employees are a little bit overpaid. Okay, so as we put together the merit pay systems here, you know, what we would do is we would say maybe our top performers who are underpaid get a 10% increase. All right, our top performers who are paid near the average get a 7% increase. And our top performers who are overpaid get only a 4% increase. Then we might say, okay, we're going to have our our satisfactory performers who are on average get a 5% increase. Our satisfactory performers who are overpaid only get a 2% increase. And our satisfactory performers who are underpaid get a 7% increase. Then the employees who are underpaid but but still need some improvement in their performance, we'll still let them get a 3% increase, but the rest of our employees who need improvement are not gonna get an increase at all. Okay, and this is a basic layout that we can look at for some merit pay increases, but it's very important that you note that poorly designed merit pay systems can create equity issues in your organization. And I'm gonna show you a couple examples of how that can happen here. All right, so let's imagine that the midpoint for our salaries is $100,000, and that's what our COMPA ratio is based off of. And you see the chart that we have here has our, our percentage increases laid out the, the way that we showed them previously. And let's say we're looking at our underpaid employees are making about $85,000 before merit pay increases. Our employees who are paid near the average are, are paid at $100,000, which is right at the midpoint. And those who are a little bit overpaid are, are currently making about $115,000. Let's calculate out what their merit pay increases would be and see how that might impact our employees. Our top performers who are underpaid are going to get an $8,500 increase. And those who are paid on average are going to get a $7,000 increase, which is pretty nice. But when we look at our overpaid employees, they're only going to get a $4,600 increase because we're, we're compensating for the fact that they're overpaid a little bit. Now, all of a sudden, when we look at our satisfactory employees who are either underpaid or, or paid on average, they're getting increases of $5,900 or $5,000, which are actually higher increases than some of our top performers are getting. So that can create a little bit of a perception of equity issue. Okay, then our sat satisfactory employees who are overpaid are, are only getting a $2,300 increase. Um, and then we've got underpaid employees who need improvement who are getting a $2,500 increase, which is again, higher than what we're seeing some of our satisfactory employees get. So we're in a situation where we have underperforming employees getting higher pay increases than some of our satisfactory employees. And these, these types of situations can create some perceptions of equity issues here. Okay, now let's move forward and we're gonna break this down a little bit because remember our COMPA, our COMPA ratios have a little bit of a range to them. So what I did here is I laid out what some of our what some of our increases would look like and what some of the, the resulting salaries would look like when our employees are kind of on the margins. Okay, and what, what I mean by that is when we're looking at COMPA ratios of less than 0.9 when the midpoint is $100,000, we're basically saying all employees who are earning under $90,000. And then here we're looking at employees who are earning 90,000 to 110,000. And here we're looking at employees who are earning more than $110,000. Okay, so you can see we've laid out the chart a little bit differently. So we have all of our employees who are underpaid are just barely under that compa ratio of 0.9. They're all at $89,000. Then our employees who are on average you know, they, they pretty much run the entire range. We've got one here who's at 91,000, one here who's at 109,000, and another who's at 91,000. And then we set all of our overpaid employees to be just barely over the COMPA ratio of 1.1. So they're all at $111,000. All right, so now we're gonna take a look and we're gonna see 
with these increases that we've laid out in this chart, what does this look like for the resulting salaries? So our top performer who was underpaid gets a pretty large increase and their, their salary is now up to $97,900. So they're no, they're no longer underpaid. Um, interestingly enough though, our top performer who was paid within, within the average, you know, compa ratio of over 0.9, but under 1.1, got a much smaller increase and they're now at $97,370. So the result of that is that our previously underpaid perform top performer is now making more than our previously um, average paid top performer simply because of where they fell on that line of compa ratios, not because of merit or anything of that nature. Okay, now we're gonna take a look at our employee who needs improvement but is underpaid, got an increase that brought them up to $91,670. And our employee who needs improvement but was previously paid within the mid-range compa ratios at 91000 So again, we have a situation where one employee's pay actually passed another employee's pay just because of where they fell on this compa ratio line. It had nothing to do with, with performance. Okay. Then we've got, um, we're going to fill in these blocks here where needs Im needs improvement, who's overpaid, is still making 111000 And our satisfactory employee who is underpaid moves up to 95000 All right. And then we're going to take a look at our satisfactory employee who is paid pretty much on average. They were at the top end of where their compa ratio could be and still be in that middle column. And they moved up to $114,450. Now, our satisfactory employee who was in the right column where they were a little bit overpaid only moved up to 113,220. So that person, again, in the middle column, they actually surpassed the person on the right, not because of anything that had to do with performance, but just because of where they fell on the lines of, of the compa ratio there. Okay. And then finally, our top performer who was a little overpaid only moved up to 115,440. So that satisfactory employee who was almost overpaid but not quite overpaid is almost making as much as that top performer who was overpaid previously. And again, has nothing to do with performance, just has to do with where they fell on that comp, on that compa ratio line. Okay, so some of the drawbacks to merit pay, uh, you, you kind of saw this here. They could be perceived as punishing employees for prior performance. So if we're working on a merit pay system, one of the things that, that we are dealing with here in this merit pay system is that employees pay increases as their performance as their performance is positive, right? So our top performing employees are going to be overpaid. And then over time, we're going to give them lower increases because we've classified them as being overpaid. That can be perceived as punishing them for their prior performance. The other drawback to merit pay is that it can be expensive as raises accumulate. Okay, so one alternative to merit pay that we, that we do have is we can have bonus systems for a one-time payout, and we can give these bonuses out uh, based upon performance rating or for achieving performance objectives. But the idea here is that we essentially look at whatever goal it is that our employees set out to achieve, and when they achieve it, we give them a one-time payout. And because of this, we're not building upon previous performance as we give these payouts out. Uh, the company saves a little money this way. This may be perceived as more equitable by employees at, at times. However, employees do stand to benefit less from the accumulation of bonuses as compared to merit pay. Finally, some additional incentives that, that we can offer our employees that we might see are things such as suggestion bonuses. And these, these occur when companies solicit suggestions from employees. And if those suggestions are implemented and, and save the company money or result in increased revenue, the employees get a bonus. Another thing that employees can get is a referral bonus. A referral bonus might be if we were looking to hire, maybe we offer a $3,000 bonus to any employee who refers a potential candidate to the company and that candidate ends up getting hired. Okay, so this has been a, uh, a little session here on incentive pay plans, showing some of the different ways that we can use individual incentives to improve performance within the organization. Hope you learned something and enjoyed the video. Thanks for joining us and we'll talk to you soon.